like they're waving at me. Yeah, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> do a uh, redo here. <laughs> Welcome, everybody, to Greater Faith Grace Bible Church and all those who are online. Again, we all greet you in the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Today, again, we want you to have a powerful encounter with the living Lord of the universe. And those at home, make sure you put aside distractions and uh, don't do that uh, channel surfing trying to see what's happening with the football games. Stay focused, amen. amen. Stay on the live streaming, amen. 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 Uh, wh whoever wins that game is not going to give you any brownie points toward God, amen. amen. All of what you do for Christ will last. So we're going to celebrate today. The goodness of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I tell you, because we know the joy of the Lord is our strength, amen? amen. And God gave us the strength to what? To be together one more time. Amen. Hallelujah. God gave us the strength to sing together amen. one more time. Amen. God gave us the strength to shout together amen. one more time. Amen. God gave us the strength, amen. Shake hands, hug one more time together. Amen. Count it all joy, amen. That God enable us to do that. Amen. And we're here today because of the goodness and the grace of Jesus. In these difficult and perilous times we live in, you would think that people would be more desirous of something that is solid that is real, and that is unchangeable. But we as believers, we come standing on the, on the word of God, the truth of God's word, amen. Today is victory celebration, amen. It's not defeat time, it's victory celebration, amen. Because his word is a lamp unto our feet, light unto our pathway, amen. amen. Hallelujah. Amen. God's word going forth. It's a blessing. We ought to be smiles and full of joy because we know the God we serve. So right now, wave at somebody. Say hello. Come on, wave at somebody. Look around and say, wave at somebody. Wave and say hello, 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 hello. Look what God did. And thank, again, thank you, praise and worship team, for our songs this morning. And to our multimedia team, God bless you. To our ushers and greeters. And to our wonderful Sunday school teachers and those attendants. God bless you. There is just a lot of work to be done, and we can do a, a lot. We just say, God, show me. I'm yours, Lord. I'm yours, Lord. Amen. And again, those who, who are watching online, uh, you can still uh, text somebody, invite somebody to uh, watch live stream. You can invite your Facebook friends. I know when you're watching on Facebook, that's the way you can uh, invite people. Invite folks to watch you online. Uh, you can never invite the wrong person. And even, even us who are in person right now, you could text somebody and say, hey, you know, can't be in person. Get, get online and watch. Amen. And invite, invest people, invest in people's lives. You know, uh, the Bible says we have not because they ask not. Amen. They come not because they ask not. <laughs> Amen. So just ask them. And again, to those who are out online and can't be in person, some of you are going through some difficult times that just physically... Be unable to be here. We pray for you that God will give you strength and grace and uh, and restore your health to where you'd be able to uh, attend in person and be a part of God's great ministry, what he's doing. Yeah. Let us pray. Almighty and sovereign God, you are Lord alone. There is no one like you who forgives all of our iniquities and our transgressions. You alone are God. Exalted, heaven is your throne, earth is your footstool. There is no one like you. You're matched in perfection. You're holy, good, and righteous. You, O oh God, are all wise, all knowing, and ever present. 
We come in your presence today, Father, that we want to pour our hearts out to you. Empty ourselves, O oh God, and say, Father, speak over us and speak to us. So I pray, Father, those here on, in person, online, will be like those in Berea, eagerly receiving the word of God and checking up to make sure the things are true. And then, Lord God, we hear the word of God. May it cause us to tremble and be, have full conviction that this is the word of God and not the word of man that transforms lives, sets the captives free, and give us the things we need that pertain to life and godliness. So, Lord God, again, watch over your word, Father. Let it not come back void, but we know God will return to you for glory and honor. Praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Bless God today. Well, today we continue in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 5. Yes, we're still plowing and plugging along in 1 Thessalonians. We started way back in uh, November last year, and we're still plugging along here. And uh, there's just so much truth that is inexhaustible, the word of God. 1 Thessalonians 1.5 says, For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and a Holy Spirit with full conviction. Just as you know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake. The title and focus of this message today is taken from the last part of the scriptures. Just as you know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake. And so with that in line, our subject today is, what kind of people are we among others? What kind of people are we among others? We know how to be among ourselves here on Sunday mornings. Amen. We know how to put on the show and do all those things right on Sunday morning, you know, to the best of our abilities, praise God. But what kind of people are we among others? who don't know the God that we know, who don't serve the God that we serve, who don't worship the God that we worship, who don't love the God that we love. Well, but before I, be, but before I begin, I am wondering who here in person, as well as those online, or watch the last two sermons from this verse, have you came to any full convictions that cause you to tremble at God's word? Any convictions that cause you to tremble at the word of God or that just Oh, well, I went to church and heard some songs and uh, didn't, really, uh, didn't really find any full convictions. If not, or, or do I just need to do a redo? Amen, lights. See, uh, uh, when you attend worship or have times alone with God, or in the company of other believers, when you see or sense the activity of God in and around you, that calls for a testimony. 
something that God convicted you of and you have full conviction, that is something from God's word. Full conviction, amen. What kind of people are we among others? Everybody we're around is not saved. They're not believers. Mm. Well, let's look at some of the translations of that verse. Like I said last week, when you're studying God's word, it's good to look at you know some different uh, translations. From the uh, Bible in basic English, it says this right here. Because our good news came to you not in word only, but in power and in a Holy Spirit, so that you were completely certain, last part word, even as you saw what our behavior to you was like from our love for you. How do people see our behavior? In the marketplace. In the workplace, in cyberspace, in the public and private sector, what is our behavior like that? Behavior. We're like in a fishbowl. First Thessalonians, the Christian standard Bible said this way here. Because our gospel did not come to you in word, only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full assurance, the last part there, you know how we lived among you for your benefit. How was our life among others benefiting them? Is our life making a difference? Is our life bringing a benefit to those who we interact with in the workplace, the marketplace, cyberspace, public and private sector? Is it benefiting them? Reading from the New Living Translation, it is spoken in this way here. <clears throat> for, we, for, for when we brought you the good news, it was not, not only with words, but also with power, for the Holy Spirit gave full assurance that what we said was true. And the last part again. And you know of our concern for you from the way we live when we were with you. Are we concerned enough about others who don't know the God that we know? Who don't love the God that we love? Who don't trust and obey the God that we trust and obey? Who don't serve and worship and praise the God that we praise? Are we concerned enough about them that we live in such a way that should be concerned about their future? What kind of people are we among others? And this is from the pulpit to the door, online and in line, all around. The Living Bible says it this way, which is a paraphrase, says it this way. When we brought you the good news, it was, it was not just meaningless chatter to you. You listened with great interest. When we told you, a, a power, when we told you had a powerful effect upon you, for the Holy Spirit gave you, gave you great and full assurance what we said was true. In the last part there. And you know how our very lives were further proof to you of the truth of our message. Are our lives the truth of God's message? In the public, workplace, marketplace, cyberspace, public and private. And this speaks to me from the pulpit to the door. Our lives must be proof of the truth that we live with full conviction. The message says it this way here. 
when the message we preached came to you, it wasn't just words. Something happened in you. The Holy Spirit put steel in your convictions. You paid careful attention to the way we lived among you. The moment somebody in the workplace, the marketplace, cyberspace, public and private sector, get the wind of the fact that you are a so-called Christian, they will pay close attention to you. See, you have a higher faith, Muslim, any other religion, they're not, they're not going to say much about that, you know, how you do so. But the moment you say you are a Christian, all of a sudden, they know exactly how a Christian should live and not live. But by higher faith or a Judaism or, I mean, but, uh, or other religion, they, they, don't, they won't mention that way there. They just say, well, you know, that's who we are, you know. But it's amazingly, when it comes to Christianity, they pay close attention to the way we live. They don't do that word about Buddhism, Hinduism. The moment you say I'm a Christian, all of a sudden, People in the workplace, the marketplace, cyberspace, all around, you know. And, you know, that's, you know, as many of you know, on the back of my car, my license plate has a witness of Jesus Christ, you know. Uh, no greater love. And uh, I make my plans. So when I'm driving, I'd be very cautious of how people around me, you know. They may see my car and say, that guy must be, he's saying one thing, but his driving and actions does not line up. So I have to be very careful when I'm driving my car, when people see it behind me, you see, you know, driving like a bat out of hell or something like that, you know. I can't do that. It reminds me, praise God, amen. It's what when I'm wearing a Christian apparel or a hat or something like that, you know. My people are going to see that. They're going to say, well, uh, what do you like there, you know? You just don't know. They pay attention how we live. Uh, well, a couple more here. From the contemporary English version, contemporary English version says this right here. When we told you the good news, it was a power and assurance that comes from the Holy Spirit and not with simple words. Last part. You knew what kind of people we were and how we helped you. Do people know what kind of people we are? Is our lives in different? In fact, the, what it's been said, the, the only difference between you and me is that on Sundays you go to church. And now sometimes our neighbors, our co-workers, in the workplace, the workplace, marketplace, cyberspace, stuff like that, the only difference they know is that in fact, on Sunday mornings you get them to go to church. You got that right there? You are no different than me. You act crazy, do stupid stuff, you know, you just just like anybody else. Only difference I see on Sunday mornings, occasionally you get them to go to church. Amen. Only difference. It, it has to go deeper than that. What kind of people are we among others? Y'all catching this here? Again, this from the pulpit to the door. I'm preaching to, I'm preaching to myself also, y'all. One more here. This is from the, uh, today's English version. For, when, for, we brought you, for we brought the good news to you, not with words only, but also with power and the Holy Spirit and with complete conviction of its truth. That last part. You know how we lived when we were, when we were with you. It was for your own good. We live in such a way it's for non-believers' own good to see the Christ in us. Now let's unpack this some more here. See, Paul, Silas, and Timothy, they endeavored, they purposed to carry out the responsibility as ministers with all truth and full conviction. They made sure that they were blameless, blameless before God and with a clear conscience to what the people of Thessalonica they made sure of that there. Paul says in 1st 2nd Timothy 1 3, he says here, I thank God in whom I serve with a clear conscience the way my forefathers did. 
as I constantly remember you in my prayers day and night. In other words, people, as believers, we need to start to have a clear conscience. Nobody can look and say, you know, you wronged me and never made it right. You did this and never made it right. We must have a clear conscience that nobody can point a finger and say, you know, you wronged me. You did. You said one thing. You hypocrisy. We should have a clear conscience. And and we know. And the church, the church, be like that. You, nobody look at it and say, "Wow, if that's the God that you serve, is that the God you claim? I don't want no parts of Him." We should be that way. See, the people of Thessalonica, they knew and saw everything that Paul. Silas and Timothy did was never for self-glory or self-seeking motives or to take advantage of them. <clears throat> Their motives were pure and not manipulative. They weren't trying to go out there and uh, police this flock and do all kind of stuff like that. They were there for the glory of God. <clears throat> See, they were willing to make any sacrifice necessary to preach and to serve the people for the glory of God. What manner of men were there among them? See, the world needs to see more real and authentic Christians by our life, our lips, and our love. In other words, nobody should be able to doubt a question, our dedication, devotion, or commitment to Jesus Christ. And that's how Paul, Silas, and Timothy were. People need to see a clear picture. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm going to water right here. Didn't bring up the stage here. Amen. All right. People need to see a clear and concise picture of God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, and not a distorted or false view of God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So we can either get a, a clear picture or a false picture. What kind of people have we proved among others proved to be? Paul, Silas, and Timothy proved to be men of genuine faith, uncomparable faith, full conviction of their faith. Paul, Paul says, you know what kind of men we proved to be among you. <clears throat> wow. Wow. <clears throat> That is powerful here. Just you know what kind of men <clears throat> we put it among you. You may have heard the old saying here. Uh, no more water here. Thank you, Jesus. The water. Amen. You may have heard the old saying here. If you were accused of being a Christian, Y'all know where I'm going with this right here? Would there be enough evidence to convict you? Say it again. If you were accused of being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Is there, is, is there enough proof in your life, your love, your service to God that say yes? That's a Christian. Here's enough evidence. Or would it be, well, I'm not quite sure if they're Christian or not right here. I don't know. I'm not sure. Is there enough evidence? If you put on a, if you're brought to trial for this person, I've accused of being a Christian, and I'm going to show you the proof of them being a Christian. Would there be enough evidence in your life to prove that? See, Paul, Silas, and Timothy 
were accused of preaching and teaching Jesus Christ, crucified and risen, and living in accordance to that belief and, and were committed to it. And there was overwhelming, indisputable evidence beyond reasonable doubt that would convict them of that, of being Christians. And the saying people from the pulpit to the door, there ought to be enough evidence for anybody to convict us and say, yes, you are a Christian. You are a believer. You are a Christian. And you, and you know yourself know that some people who say believe and you know there's no evidence that, that, can, that you can say, yeah, that's proof, that's proof. You got evidence to show they're not a Christian. And we can do that, you know. Look what Paul said in these sacred scriptures. He said, Philippians 1.21, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. That's conviction right there. Paul says in, in Acts 20, 18 to 24, when he's giving his farewell address to the church at Ephesus, he says these words here. He says, uh, and when they had come to him, he said to them, you yourselves know from the first day I set foot in Asia, how I was with you the whole time, serving the Lord with all humility, with tears, and with trial, which came upon me through the plot of the Jews. How I did not shrink from declaring you anything that was profitable and teaching you publicly from house to house, solemnly testifying to both Jews and Greeks a repentance toward God and faith. And our Lord Jesus Christ says, and now behold, I am bound by the Spirit. I'm on my way to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit solemnly testifies to me in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions await me. Then it says in that last part right here, but I do not consider my life any account or dear to myself. So that I may finish my course and the ministry I received from the Lord Jesus Christ to solemnly testify of the gospel of grace. Evidence that Paul was steadfast. He said, none of these things move me. I see bonds and afflictions awaiting me. I see problems and trials coming my way. And Paul said, none of these things move me. I'm going to finish my course. God has given us a course. We need to finish it. Finish well. Finish strong. See, everything Paul did live and said after his conversion, experience was proof that he was a new creation in Christ Jesus. See, our life is a letter to the world. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 3, 2, you are a letter written in our hearts, known and read by all men. People are reading us daily. You say, I'm a believer, guess what? You're being read daily. We are an open letter. We're in a fishbowl. A letter. That was a couple, but Jesus said, let your light so shine that men may see your good works. And glorify Father which is in heaven. We are a letter written in our hearts, known read by all men. Paul knew the meaning of being a disciple, and we are called to be disciples. I love this quote by A.W. Tozer, had a reference to how we ought to live among others. A.W. Tozer said this right here. As a Christian disciple, we should do whatever we should be, whatever we are, wherever we are. Say it again here. As Christian disciples, we should be whatever we are, wherever we are. Like a diamond, it doesn't adjust. It's always a diamond. Amen? A diamond is always a diamond. It does not adjust. It's always a diamond. He goes on to say, 
He goes on to say, also Christians are to always be Christians. We are not Christians if we have to wait for the right atmosphere to practice our religion. We are not Christians if we have to go to church to be blessed. We are not Christians until we're thoroughly, until we're thoroughly Christ, until we have reached the point of no return, no seasonal anymore, but regular always. Then the Lord says, we are real disciples who are following on to know the Lord. Thoroughly. We're at the point of no return. Paul, Silas, and Timothy were at the point of no return. There was no turning back. No turning back. No turning back. Trials came. Situation came, but there was no turning back. And the Apostle Paul even told the Philippians how we ought to live. In Philippians 2, 14 through 15, I believe I've got the right scripture here, prayer. Philippians 2, 14 through 15. How I want to live among, prove us among people, it says. Paul told them, do all things. Let's say all things. All things. All things. And all means all. All things without grumbling or disputing. Ouch. I just grumble about coming to church this morning. I just grumble about this right here. I just grumble about this right here. He said, do all things without grumbling or disputing. Why? So that you will prove yourself to be blameless and innocent children of God above, re innocent children of God above, above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you appear as lights to the world. Do all things without grumbling or disputing. So you will prove yourself to be blameless and innocent children of God, be above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you appear as lights in the world. Don't tell them right now. People, we're in the midst. It don't take no rogue scholar to look around and see that the time we're living in right now is crooked and perverse. It's all across the workplace, marketplace, cyberspace, television, radio. Every you watch TV shows, watch commercials. There's some underlying perverseness in that someplace, and we're watching it. You gotta guard your minds, protect your minds. What happened is. I'm going a little, little, little uh, off script here. Hope I don't get too much trouble here. But uh, uh, what happened is <clears throat> to get us away from the things of God, the world does a gentle push. It don't come barging in and throwing it all down. It gently just pushes. Push. No resist. A little more pushing. Okay, a little more pushing. Not a very hard push, just a little more push. We, we step a little back, a little more push. We accept a little more. Everybody accept a little more. Then this thing, look, finally, bam. They don't come and just knock on one side. That'd be dramatic, but it's gently, the world's just gently push at us. Slowly, just pushing us. Slowly and gently. The next thing you know, we've fallen over. It's a gentle push. It's crooked perverseness. They don't come out. They just gently push at us. Bring a little bit of this, little bit of this to our lives. Yeah. Okay. Little, okay. You know, so we give a little bit more, and they keep pushing. And this thing, you know what? The wall has fallen over. That's why the Bible says resist. The first push, we have to resist it. Whom appear as lights. Said, so do all things without grumbling and disputing. Here's what a, a writer, a Roger Earls, Ellsworth, says about. It's kind of funny here. It's when we uh, grumble and dispute. You know what we're saying when we grumble and dispute? You know what we're saying, really? Here's the saying. He says, uh, 
when we complain and grumble, we are telling those around us that we believe God is doing a very poor job and if given the opportunity, we could do much better. <laughs> we, that's what grumbling is. We're saying, God, you're doing a terrible job. And if I was in charge, God, guess what? I'd do a whole lot better. <laughs> that's what, when you're grumbling and complaining about saying, God, I believe, God, you're just doing a terrible job. You're not doing a good job. But God, tell you what, God, if you put me in charge, guess what? <laughs> I'll do a lot better job. Don't do that, amen. God is large and God is in charge. He is sovereign and he does everything according to his will. His will. I want to give you a little, uh, little test here about God. So God is in charge doing his will here. Again, I'm going a little off script right here. Hope I get a little, and you guys this time give me a little feedback, okay? Please give me a little feedback here. Now, many of us have read, recited, memorized it, heard sermons about it, teach about it, the Lord's Prayer. Amen? Found in Matthew chapter 6. Amen? Have read it, recited it, heard sermons about it, preached and stuff like that, you know? And, uh, I'm a little like got gotcha, you, though. Uh, when, when you read that there, here's so much about that. I studied, meditated. What are the, what are the what are some of the main takeaways that you get from that 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 uh, the Lord's prayer? It's okay. I mean, there's no, no there's no wrong answer. I mean, just what if you read it? What does some what are some takeaways from it there? Father, amen. Good. And, and a lot of people get they get like our Father. Leaves out the temptation, uh, your will, okay, things. But you know something, the other day, God's word is just so rich and so deep, it's inexhaustible. He always brings more truth. And the other day, as I was reading that right there, and just saying, Lord, speak to me, uh, two things really begin to stand up, stand up to me on that, on that there scripture right there. And here were these two things were. And I try to uh, remember this and keep this in my mind and my spirit. Two things here. Your kingdom, your will. Your kingdom, your will. Your kingdom, your will. That means it's God's kingdom and therefore his will. It's his kingdom. And therefore he does whatever he wants to do with his kingdom. And I think I believe, I believe until we come to that there, grasp that right there, and receive and understand that, hey, God, it's your kingdom. Hallelujah. I have no say, so it's your kingdom. And because, God, it's your kingdom, it's your will. We say, God, it's your will, but we forget to connect his kingdom also. Your kingdom, your will. Well, he said, God, let your will be done. Why? Because it's his kingdom. His kingdom. And because it's his kingdom, he does whatever, whatever to his good pleasure and purpose is his will. Because he's, and what happened, what, we're, what happened to people, we're trying to build our own little kingdoms according to our will. This is my little kingdom, right? my kingdom right here. We're trying to build our kingdoms this is saying, God, it's your kingdom and your will. When you can grasp that, wrap your head around that, receive and believe that, your life will be changed. You say, everything happened to God, it's your kingdom. It's your kingdom. So God, but your kingdom, you're totally in charge. It's your will. You do what you want to do. I'm not God, it's your kingdom. And we forget that. We still want to say your will, God, but still want to be somewhat in charge. Because we think it's still our kingdom. <laughs> amen. Little sidebar. We're working on working it a while. Amen. Working on it a while. Let me move on here. A few more things to share with you here before we close up here. Yes, see, Paul, he never grumbled or complained about his terrible conditions or situations he found himself in. What he did, what, what did Paul do? He rejoiced. Paul rejoiced and was thankful. And that's what kind of person he showed himself to the church at Thessalonica. 
trials came, troubles came, Paul didn't murmur and complain, oh God, why this, why me, why me? No. He rejoiced. Paul said in Romans 5, 3, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, in, and that Paul knew that suffering produced endurance. He rejoiced in it. He danced in it. He didn't complain about it. And that's the amount of purpose he proved to be among the church of Thessalonica. That's where it comes to full conviction. See, Paul, 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 Paul knew the connection between suffering and comfort. And sometimes we don't understand that connection right there. There is a connection right there. In 2 Corinthians 1 5, you may have got this when I texted this week about this right here. Paul says, 2 Corinthians 1 5, Paul says, just as the sufferings of Christ are in abundance. Everybody say abundance. He said, just as the sufferings of Christ are ours in abundance. He says, abundant suffering. It's abundant. He goes on to say, so also. Our comfort is abundant through Christ. What's the connection right there? Abundant suffering, get abundant comfort. Isn't that simple right there? Abundant suffering, guess what? You get abundant comfort. But how much, but how bad the suffering is what God gives you? Just as much comfort. What happens sometimes? We only focus on the abundance of suffering. But Paul says, just as the abundance, just as the manifold suffering, so also is our comfort. That should help you right there. That should bless you real good right there. You see, Paul said, I'm suffering abundantly. Abundantly. But it says, so do I experience God's abundant comfort. There's a balance right there. And that's makes things balance out right there. Suffering, comfort, there's a balance right there. Praise God, amen. For when we suffer, say, God, I also will experience your abundant comfort. That's what God does. That's why it's called the God of all comfort. In the midst of your suffering, in the midst of your pain, in the midst of your grief, your persecution, all the affliction, no matter how abundant it is, health, fine, whatever it may be, God, Paul says, God will give us abundant comfort also. But we, don't, but we listen to the lie. The devil tell us, oh, this is so much you can't get from me. Say, devil, I'm also going to receive God's comfort too. Amen. Amen. A couple more right here. Is this helping you so far, people? Yeah. Are you guys grasping this here? Yeah. Not a grasp, I want you to have your full conviction and tremble at God's word. See, if anybody, anybody had a reason to grumble or complain, it was the Apostle Paul. Let's check out the record. He was beaten with rods, put in jail numerous times. He rejoiced. He was ran out of town for preaching. He rejoiced. He was stoned and left for dead in Derby. Didn't complain. He was shipwrecked. Didn't complain. Sleepless nights and hunger. Didn't complain. False accused of much persecution. Didn't complain. Because Paul had abundant suffering, but also had God's abundant comfort. He knew it all worked together. For the good of God, for, for those who love to call according to his purposes. Because he knew his kingdom, his will. And though Paul and his companions proved the men of genuine faith, tried and tested, with all the pain and suffering, it did not harden them or make them mean, angry, or grumbling, or complaining. Sometimes the suffering can do one or two things for you. It will harden you or soften you. 
harden you toward God or soften you toward the things of God. Like boiling water, it can make an egg hard. Amen. And also boiling water can soften things to make things flexible. Amen. Amen. It does it both ways there. So, so look what, so, uh, so what happens, all that happened to Paul, he goes to us and like he says, you know what manner of men we proved among you. So all that right there, all that right there, what did they learn from Paul? We look at the scriptures here. First Thessalonians 5, 7, he says, for we never came to you with flattering speech, as you know, nor a pretext for greed, God is witness. Nor do we see glory from men, either from you or from others, even though the apostle of Christ we may have received authority. You know, Paul said, you know, all the suffering I've been through right here, you guys should pay up for this right here. You should owe me something. I mean, I've been, I've been sleepless, I've been shipwrecked, all the stuff right here, you know. You guys, should, you know, hey, you guys should do something for me, you know. But what did he say here? All that right there, the heart, he says here, but we proved, if I say proved, proved. proved. We prove to be gentle among you as a nursing mother tenderly cares for her own children. Paul said, I've been through a lot, but my heart is still soft towards God's people. He proved to be gentle. So uh, when you go through the trials of life, do you still make you, are you still gentle and kind? When you have a rough day, things don't work out your way. Had a bad hair, they're bad to the office. Focusing on your last nerve, your reserved nerve. Are you still gentle? Or did that one little thing just ruin your whole day? Blown out of, you just, your whole day is wrecked. Say, you ruined my day. Or are you still gentle? Paul said, Paul said, every reason in the world to be mean, to say, well, you know, I'll take it on you folks, so you know. And sometimes we do that, you know. We kick the dog at the door. The dog did nothing to us. We just want to kick somebody, you know. Paul was still gentle. Yes, we have problems and pain and suffering. And yes, people can mistreat us. I'm not making, yes, people, people are cruel. People don't have Jesus. They, they do things. They hurt us. They harm us. They, they, they afflict us. Yes, all those things right there. But that does not give us a reason to be unkind to the next person we meet. Just because of that clerk at the store gave you a hard time and didn't, and with all that stuff with you right there, you know, no need to rush out the store and, and uh, get in your car and speed off. <laughs> so leave for that right there. Be gentle, amen. Walk in the house. Don't know who I am. <laughs> Just be gentle. Paul was gentle. You're on the phone when you're trying to explain to somebody and they, they give you a hard time, slam the phone down. Just be gentle. Don't let folks affect you like that, amen. Paul said, I put me gentle among you. I don't let the world, I, I, I don't let the world change me, I change the world. I don't let people change me, I change people. Then he says here, he also proved to be a hard worker, devout, upright, blameless, encouraging, and exhorting them in a fatherly fashion. The scripture says here, 1 Thessalonians 9 to 11, For you recall, brethren, our labor and hardship, how working night and day, and so not to be a burden to any of you, we proclaim to you the gospel of God, you are witnesses. And so is God how we devoutly and uprightly and blamelessly we behave toward you believers. Just as you know, we were exhorting and encouraging and employing each one of you as a father with his own children. See how Paul, you two concepts right there? A nurturing mom and exhorting father. He didn't let the day ruin his relationship with the people, the persecution. He still maintained his integrity. 
he still knew how to respond, how to act. That's what it's about. What kind of people are we among others? In the midst of our pain and suffering and being mistreated and abused, stuff like that, do we take it to others? We just say, God, it's your kingdom and it's your will. Great suffering, but also I'm getting great comfort. It's going to be okay. The Thessalonians had seen and experienced firsthand three men who had proved to them that they lived what they preached and preached what they lived. Ouch! From the pulpit to the door. I'll say it again. The Thessalonians had seen and experienced firsthand three men who had proved to them that what they lived and preached, and they preached what they lived. You know, uh, people, it's easy to preach a sermon, but it's hard to live one. Amen? Say it again. It's easy to preach a sermon, but my, 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 it is hard to live one. Amen? Sunday to Sunday, week after week, 50 times you guys come and hear a sermon, but living out what I'm saying on Sunday morning, that's a challenge. Amen. It's a challenge. The lips, life, and love of these three men was proof that the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit was upon them as they preached and taught the good news of Jesus Christ and Christ alone was a remedy and is a remedy and a cure for a sinful and broken world that we still live in today. We're all fallen and depraved human beings. Without God's gracious act of mercy, none of us ever be saved. None of us ever be saved. And I think the fact that God, in his gracious act of mercy and kindness, saved us when none of us deserved it, that should make you tremble. God had every right, it's his kingdom, his will, every right to dismiss all of us. God had every right to send every last person to a burning hell eternally separate from him. We had all broken God, so we all come short. We all missed the mark. None righteous, none that doeth good. He had every right to condemn all of us. But God, in his gracious act of mercy, saved called, chose, that should make you tremble. A.W. Toad said this right here. A true Christian fears God with trembling, reverence, and yet he's, yet he's not afraid of God at all. He draws nigh to God with full assurance of faith and victory, and yet at the same time is trembling with holy awe and fear. I'm coming near God, I'm still trembling with God and your mercy How do we conclude the application here? What kind of people are we to be among others? The sacred scriptures get the answer to that right there. As amazing, you can pull the truth just right from the word of God, from the passage you're teaching from. It so, it's always just explains itself there. What are we to do? First Thessalonians 1, 2 says, we give thanks. Give thanks. Give thanks. Give thanks. Give thanks with a grateful heart. See, then we say, thank you, Lord God. Be a thankful person. Thank you, Lord God. You give thanks to God. Even if you don't feel like it. Even if you don't want to. Give thanks to you feel like it. Just keep on giving thanks to God. Man. In your workplace. When you write, when you, when you get to your job thing, you know, just saying, oh my God, I face these terrible people today. Just say, God, I thank you. I have arrived safely. Some folks did not make it to the job safely. Amen. Thank you, Lord God. You allowed me to get here safely in my job. Thank you, Lord. Give thanks to God. 
Secondly, pray for those around you. Pray for those around you. On your workplace, the marketplace, cyberspace. You all have a uh, smartphones. You know, there's people in your contact list. You ever thought maybe to, maybe uh, once a week to text maybe five people to say, you know something? You're my contact list. I thank God for you. I thank God that, that you're part of my life. I, I, I want you to, I've been praying for you this week, and I will continue to pray for you. So simple. You got a phone. You're scrolling all the day long. You're scrolling. Look at this right here. When it come, you know, you're watching TV. Just, just shut the TV for five minutes. Look at your contact list right there. All, all of you have at least, I know, probably 15, 20 people on your, on your list that you, that's on your list right there. You must have some relationship with them, you know. They're on your list there. Just text them. Say, you know, hey, Pookie, I'm praying for you. Janika, I'm praying for you. Andy, I'm praying for you. I thank God for you. I contact you. Simple things like that, you know. Living up um, amongst them. Couple of things right here. Uh, demonstrate your work of faith and love and be steadfast. Whatever we do on our job, do it for the best of your abilities. Labor, sometimes say, well, you know, you want, say, well, you know, don't say, well, that's not my job description. Do it anyway. I'll kill you. I'm not going to murder you. How about my job? I don't get paid for that right there. No, do it for the glory of God. God will forget your labor of love. And be steadfast. You hope around people, among others, you know. When people are complaining how bad things are, you know, yes, it's bad, but guess what? My hope was in God. My hope was in God going to be okay. Live a life of full conviction in God's word. That's how we kind of be among others. That's what Paul was amongst them. That's why Paul says, you know how he proved to be among you. There was enough evidence to convict them of being Christians. Let me close these last two quotes in a word of prayer. John Calvin says this right here. Our service cannot be approved of God except it is founded in his word. What does God's word say? That's the key right there. And then the final quote by uh, uh, John Calvin. Mm, not John Calvin. Uh, uh, Charles Spurgeon says, uh, let your lives adorn your faith. Let your example adorn your creed. Above all, live in Christ, Jesus, walk in him, giving credence to no teaching, but that which is manifested, approved of Jesus. Walk in it, give, walk in it, let it be manifested, approved of him, and owned by the Holy Spirit, and cleave fast to the word of God. Let us pray. Holy Father, in these times that we live in, there's so much disdain, unholiness, unrighteousness, pain, persecution, distress of being distraught, accusations, unholiness, ungodliness. Father, we as believers, we're challenged daily and what kind of people we are among others. So, Father, I pray now that you would just empower us by the Holy Ghost that we be submitted and surrendered to you, Father, that we can show to a perverse and crooked generation that we are lights of the world, that in you we live, move, and have our being. Lord God, we know that we cannot do this by ourselves, but you, O oh God, give us the power and equip us through the power of the Holy Spirit. For God, we know it is you working in us to do of your will and your purposes. 
So, Father, let us take an honest look at ourselves today going forward. And let us be a purpose, oh God. Be mindful of what kind of people we prove to be among a crooked and perverse generation. And Lord, I know we're not always going to live up to it. We're going to fail at times, Father. Father, I pray those times, oh God. Give us the grace, oh God, to lift us up, Father. Forgive us, oh God. Give us the strength, oh God, to do better the next time. And press on, Father, in your word, being useful for you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Give God some praise. Amen, amen, amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank you. I pray that this word from uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 has impacted you, has influenced you, has instructed you, has helped you to look in that mirror and say, God, what kind of person am I proven to be amongst a crooked and perverse generation? We do it by the power of the Holy Spirit. Those who are watching online, those who are in person, those who are believers, may God give you the grace and the strength to daily Live out this faith in a way that honors and glorifies God. If you're here today in person, online, and there's a tender voice calling on you, and your eyes are being opened, your heart is being something revealed in your heart, you feel a touch and a tug of God, something that's convicting you, saying, you know, You are a sinful person. You have offended a holy and righteous God. And because of that, that you realize and recognize God is holy, and you say, wow, God, I'm unclean. I need Jesus. God is speaking about your uncleanliness. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. If you feel that conviction, then you need to say, I believe. I believe. I know I'm a depraved, lost human being. And God's word opened my heart to show me that I, I'm a sinful person, a crooked and perverse generation. And there's no way I can get out except by God's grace and mercy. That's you today. You're online or watching some other time. Your next step is to simply say, Lord, I believe, I repent. I know that you are God alone. And then when you do, they want to follow up with you. So text the word Jesus to 833-614-8827. For those of you, I also want to pray for you today. Father, in the name of Jesus, help your people. Help us, oh God, to be strengthened, to live godly lives. And the Lord, sometimes in the midst of our pain and persecution and pain and persecution. We're not always that gentle or kind. So Father, restore us the right attitude and right spirit, Father. Let our faith be the victory. Let us proclaim you, God, as Lord, your kingdom and your will. Refresh, renew, restore our hope, O oh God, that we can leave this place as shining lights, more determined, more focused, O oh God, to be the kind of people approved by you, God, that we're living out our faith in victory and we're having a clear conscience toward God and toward men. We give you praise and glory in Jesus' name.
Amen. Give God some praise. Amen. Amen. Amen.